Okay, welcome to the hopefully last uh, online course of this semester and any semester. So much trouble and work, but at least we're all safe. Uh, this week, well, you guys read this essay, Need to Find Me? Ask my ham man. Uh, let's jump right in. Question one. Why do you think the author has such close relationships with food merchants rather than for instance, bank tellers are merchants of daily necessities. Um, and most of you answered uh, because we all need food. Uh, this group very smartly answered because the author is a food writer, uh, which means she has a closer relationship with food and food merchants. Um, not only because, uh, as this group says, because she writes about food, but uh, also what drives her to write about food, her interest and passion for food, also naturally would uh, deepen her relationships with people who sell her that food. Um, and uh, one group also mentioned that it's because uh, we eat food at set times during the day. So she meets with these merchants regularly and that helps to form a closer relationship. Um, and that also explains why, for instance, uh, her mother's relationship with her dry cleaners uh, seems to be closer than, than you would expect as well, because usually we do our laundry on a fixed or set schedule. Uh, some of you, I think uh, one, one group has kind of misunderstood the last part of the question. Merchants of daily necessities. So uh, this part of the question is comparing food merchants and merchants of daily necessities. So saying that food merchants, food is a daily necessity, doesn't really answer that part of the question. Uh, but the other answers are quite good. Question two. For the author, her mother is both not here and still here. How do you think her mother experiences her? And by her, I mean the author. Uh, I, I do have to apologize. This question was not very clear. Um, most of you answered that uh, using evidence from, this, from the essay about how her mother cares for her, maybe is a bit overprotective of her, uh, and uh, misses her and worries about her when she's away in Paris, living in Paris. Uh, but actually, this question is asking... Uh, about after her mother develops Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's why the first part of the question is here. Uh, I should have added that to the question. So th what I'm actually asking is, how do you think her mother with Parkinson's experiences her daughter? Um, and uh, I think one, one group answered this question, this part of the question that I, that I was actually trying to ask by saying that uh, sometimes she remembers, sometimes she forgets. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, she still cares about her daughter, even though her ability is starting to become limited little by little. That is true. And um, group four adds that um, as her mother's condition worsens, she may depend on her daughter more and more, or she uh, would want to see her daughter. Uh, the feeling would be stronger and stronger because she knows she's about to die. Uh, and that is uh, also very true. Um, Ah, this group, group three. You guys said uh, the last sentence of your answer. The author's mother, on the other hand, might probably lose the memory of the author. That's what I wanted to try to get at. Um, from the author's perspective, her mother doesn't forget her all of a sudden, right? She forgets her sometimes, once in a while, uh, intermittently is the word. Uh, but what would it feel like to have Parkinson's or Alzheimer's 
or any of these uh, mentally degenerative diseases? What would it feel like to gradually sometimes uh, forget who one of your closest uh, people in your life are? That's what I was trying to ask with this question. Uh, because when you when it's someone else who's, who starts to forget about you, you can see a, sometimes they remember, sometimes they forget. But the idea of forgetting isn't a blank space in your mind. If you forget someone or something, uh, that sorry, if you um, start to forget who someone is, who is right in front of you, that person doesn't disappear. So when when uh, her mother sees the author and forgets who she is, she still sees a person. And so to her mother, that person is a stranger. Uh, a stranger who, uh, I assume, has an uncanny resemblance to her other daughters and maybe to her own image of herself when she looks into the mirror. So uh, I, what I wanted you to think about is what that feels like. To have someone who uh, they say and they act like they are they have a close relationship with you but you don't remember them you to you that person is a stranger how would that feel like and sometimes you remember sometimes you don't remember sometimes you have a very vague uh, impression that this person should be someone you know and yet you can't remember or you don't know uh, being unable to remember and not knowing uh, can often be the same, uh, have be the same experience. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, if for the author her mother is both here and not here, then for her mother, she herself, the daughter, is familiar and unfamiliar, or intimate and strange at the same time. That's a very uh, different way of experiencing your relationship with people in your life. Question three. The author says, we have been able to maintain a gallows sense of humor in an attempt to productively deal with our pain. Can you spot some examples? And I'm sure you looked this up in the dictionary. A gallows sense of humor means having a very black or dark sense of humor. Um, and most of you selected uh, the first and third example that you see here on the screen. The first one about using uh, mineral water, I'm uh, sorry, carbonated water instead of mineral water to clean the, uh, her nose. And the third one about calling uh, their team in the Parkinson's walk, the movers and shakers. Uh, and if you don't get these jokes and your group didn't adequately explain them to you, um, the first one, the key word is uh, waterboard is uh, a kind of torture that the United States used during the 2003 Iraq war. Uh, and what it, what they do is they take a wet cloth and they, first of all, you're, you're, uh, you're uh, like chained or like locked, you're fixed to like a, a board on, and you're lying on your back and you can't move. You're, con you're constrained to the board. And uh, they, there are two people. One person takes a wet cloth and stretches it tight over your face, but especially your nose and mouth. And the second person takes water and pours it on top of the cloth, uh, on top of your mouth and nose. And it gives you a sense of drowning and being unable to breathe without actually drowning. And so the United States government at that time uh, set forth a legal argument that this is not actually torture because it doesn't leave lasting marks and or damage on the body, which of course is is absurd. Uh, uh, torture obviously is fundamentally a, a mental experience. Uh, if you if if someone can cut up your body and let you not feel anything, that's not torture. That's surgery. Uh, but anyway, so that's what waterboarding is. Uh, so here, of course, the word uh, isn't that specific. It basically just means a kind of torture, uh, a kind of pain. And it's connected with water, so the author uses this word waterboard. 
The other joke, uh, the movers and shakers, I'm sure you know Parkinson's disease causes uh, people to uh, sh have like shaking hands, uncontrollably shaking hands. Uh, so before it was given the formal name of Parkinson's disease, uh, the disease used to be called the shakes. Uh, and so the movers and shakers, first of all, it's a walk. Uh, a walk is uh, done for charity. Usually is like you, you get, uh, in this case, it's probably uh, people with Parkinson's disease and they walk a certain distance and people encourage them by donating money. It raises awareness, lets people know that, uh, reminds people that there is these group of people in society who could use some help and gives people a place to donate money to provide that help. So the walk is itself moving. It's a kind of movement. And of course, because it's Parkinson's disease, uh, shaking hands, so shakers. And then finally, movers and shakers usually refers to like uh, important people who uh, can get things done or the people you need to talk to in order to get something done. They're movers and shakers. So it's like, a, I guess it's a triple pun. Um, in terms of gallows humor, uh, these two are probably the main examples, but uh, it related to Parkinson's disease. But in fact, the author uses a lot of different examples of humor that may not be considered gallows humor or, or doesn't have to do with Parkinson's disease. Let's take a look. Actually, the entire essay is written, or the first half at least, is written in a kind of joking, slightly ironic tone. And you can tell because the second sentence it supports this claim. This is actually a rather academic sentence or a legal sentence. right? If I claim something, that means I'm arguing for something. And if I argue for something, I need evidence. One kind of evidence could be personal experience. So here she's saying, experience support this claim. Uh, and the claim, of course, is, is quite exaggerated. The man who sells me ham is the first person who would notice if I were dead. Probably not true. Although it could probably be true. If you live alone in a big city without regular visitors, then maybe, yeah, the ham man would be uh, the first person who realizes something is wrong, at least. Maybe uh, he, the ham merchant wouldn't jump directly into, oh my god, she's dead, but the they would know something is wrong. Uh, the third paragraph here, the, from the middle, I'm the human equivalent of a stray dog who wanders from shop to shop in search of whoever will give me a snack. Uh, it's kind of laughing at herself. Uh, the first line of this paragraph is also kind of funny. Uh, she's been talking about how people might think she's dead. And so when she tries to describe the ham shop, she uses imagery of death, a coffin, and pig parts, body parts of a pig, also connected to death. The next paragraph, first line, the ham man is the biggest ham of all. Ham here means uh, uh, you can either say it's a bad actor or a flamboyant, melodramatic actor. Uh, but here, or, or someone who likes to perform. Uh, but here it's more connected to the idea of uh, being uh, emotionally exaggerated. Like uh, he is willing to participate in or join in emotional outbursts and, and uh, have this strong emotional connection with the author. So she calls him a ham, a big ham. here in this paragraph, without my wine guy, where would I drink and weep now? At home like a normal person? Is kind of also laughing at herself. Here in this paragraph, uh, again, turning something that people think is strange into something normal and then thereby uh, turning other people's regular uh, life habits into something strange. How would I be able to confidently make terrible life choices if my wine-selling astrologer couldn't reach me. 
Of course, most people don't want to make terrible life choices, so it's also laughing at herself. This paragraph, still laughing at herself, uh, describing uh, how she forms these relationships as a kind of Stockholm syndrome, where like they can't move, they're a captive audience. They have to listen to her and gradually develop a friendship. By the way, I recently read that the origin of the term Stockholm Syndrome is actually a smear, or it's, it's, it's a distortion of the truth. So it, it was a bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden, and the robber was very kind, very pleasant, uh, and it was the police, who at the time had never faced a, a bank robbery before, who were rude and violent and uh, very non-negotiable, very rigid and unwilling to compromise. And so therefore it was the police who were putting everyone in danger. So uh, one of the women uh, hostages who became the main communicator between robber and the police uh, so became angry at how the government and the police were handling the situation. And so after she was uh, rescued, she went on the radio to to criticize the police and the government. And in, in return, the police brought out this a uh, psychiatrist who really wasn't very qualified to do to say anything uh, and and this, this psychiatrist who was a guy uh, came up with this idea of uh, women who are taken hostage and fall in love with their uh, cat with their uh, hostage or kidnappers I guess with the bad guy uh, and he called it Stockholm syndrome uh, and as you can tell from the story, uh, the woman did not fall in love with the bank robber. She simply saw what was going on and made very valid criticisms. Uh, but again, because uh, most people tend not to believe women when women uh, share experiences that are very different from men's experiences or from what people expect uh, women's experiences should be, um, the idea of Stockholm Syndrome caught on and even uh, last to this day. Uh, but of course most psychiatrists know that this is not a real disease and uh, the research done on Stockholm Syndrome is very inconsistent. There's no single diagnosis. It's more a pop cultural idea than an actual medical term. Anyway, here last paragraph, uh, supporting my ham habit. Uh, this is actually a phrase used to describe drug habits. So usually you would see uh, someone is supporting my heroin habit, which means they're giving me money so that I can keep doing heroin. Um, and of course, you know, the author is not addicted to ham. She just simply eats it regularly and meets with her ham guy regularly. But it's so regular, it's so unusual that she uses this phrase to laugh at herself. Uh, this paragraph, starting from the, well, I guess the entire thing is kind of funny. Uh, the basic situation is, she, in college, she doesn't answer her mother's phone calls, so her mother calls like the campus police or the actual police to knock on her door to check up on her, see if she's alive or not. Uh, so the see if she's safe or alive or not is translated into uh, my untimely murder. Of course, there's no such thing as a timely murder. Well, I guess if you think someone deserves to die, then that could be a timely murder. But most people, most murders are untimely. Uh, this is also a kind of joke, sort of an exaggeration. Lord knows, uh, in Chinese it would be tian zi dao, or which means like uh, it's obvious uh, if you knew the situation. If you knew everything, you wouldn't be surprised. Lord, of course, here refers to Jesus Christ. Uh, and then the following line, public safety officers, is also a very legal term, uh, which creates an ironic tone, because basically she just means campus police. One group uh, also caught this joke in the next paragraph. She struggles to put on her seatbelt. Her brain and body and seatbelt just don't click in the right way anymore. It's a pun on the word click. Click could mean that they fit together, uh, 
metaphorically speaking, like you describe A and B. When you say A and B click, that you mean they go well together, two people. Uh, so if someone's brain and body don't click, that means that there's a kind of distance between the two, uh, which is, of course, what Parkinson's is, a uh, slow inability or a slow loss of control of one's body. But of course, click could also be literal, uh, the sound made but when you put it uh, when you strap in yourself using a seatbelt. So that's a small joke there. The last line of this paragraph is very interesting because it's written like a joke, but it's actually an accurate description of the author's internal psychological state convinced I am some kind of monster. It, this is actually a phrase that's often used uh, in English as a kind of joke. Like, uh, you know, when someone does something that people think is slightly strange or unusual, uh, you might hear someone say, what are you, some kind of monster? Or uh, another similar phrase is, what are you, a serial killer? Uh, but here it's making a joke and then using that joke to express a deeply felt uh, personal emotion because of course uh, if, if she told someone that she did this and, and that person told her uh, what are you some kind of monster it would be a bad joke because the author would feel like she is in some way a kind of monster Okay, those are all the jokes. Question four. How would you describe the author's idea of home? Um, now this answer, uh, I think, is... This question had the most diverse answers from all the groups. Um, but most of you focused on, that by the end of the essay, the author feels like basically home is where uh, she can find people who care about her, where she can build a life for herself, basically where she feels like she belongs. Um, now, some of you also, like this group, uh, uh, talked about the author's feeling or idea of home uh, before her mom developed Parkinson's disease, or in other words, earlier in her life, before the author moved to Paris. And here it seems like her idea of home is tied up with her mother. Um, as she quotes the poet in, this, in the essay, your mother is your first home. And she surely does feel this way. So home, perhaps I think most for most of us, if we have a stable childhood, our first idea of home is a fixed place with fixed people and a fixed routine. Um, but as the author moves to Paris to start a different life, and as she slowly loses her mother to Parkinson's disease, her idea of home changes from that very static idea to a more flexible and uh, self-oriented idea of home. Home is wherever she feels that she can belong and she can make herself feel a sense of belonging by creating new relationships with people and building a new schedule and forming a new community of people who care for her and for whom she cares as well. Let's take a short break. Uh, for this break, I just wanted to draw your attention to this very strange picture of Group 4's uh, discussion. So first of all, 3% battery. Who is the brave, brave student who uh, kept with the discussion without a charger until they only had 3% left. Then you have 6 out of 7 people, which means one person was not part of the discussion. And I caught you, whoever you are. And finally, you guys discussed for almost 2 hours. I'm very, very impressed, unless, of course, Half an hour was spent on technical issues, and another half hour was spent on trying to find the seventh person. Question 5. Do you think, and if so, how, the author's experience might be different if she were a man? 
What might that say about our cultural ideas of masculine sociality? Uh, so all of your answers uh, were very similar, and you guys talked about uh, feminine sociality that is actually seen in, in the essay that we have, and uh, masculine sociality that might change the essay if the author were a man. So let's talk about the first one first, feminine sociality. So in the essay, we see that the author uh, talks a lot with people uh, that she's originally not very close with, and by talking, builds a stronger and more intimate relationship with them, uh, both men and women, uh, food merchants. And also that she sometimes uh, can get quite emotional, especially when she's talking about like failed relationships or bad dates or just, you know, a negative patch of life that she's going through. And she talks about crying into uh, her wine guy's sweater. Uh, and uh, the essay also talks about uh, how her mother is worried about her uh, living alone in Paris, uh, both before, like the first time she leaves to Paris and the last time uh, after already uh, her mother already uh, is suffering more from Parkinson's disease. Uh, and this is also connected to the fact that her mother had three daughters. And uh, the author is the youngest daughter, I think. Uh, and so in their household, she had no brothers. Her mother had no son. Taking care of uh, girls and young women is the only kind of taking care that, uh, that the author's mother knows. Unless you count uh, taking care of her husband, that that should also count, right? On the other hand, if the author were a man, uh, all of these uh, stereotypes would probably be reversed, as you guys say. Um, men in society, like we've been talking these past few weeks a lot about how a patriarchal society views women and expects women to behave, and how men in a patriarchal society sees value in women, or doesn't see value in women. Uh, but a patriarchal society also limits men as well. Um, because it, if there are some things that only women can do, that means that men can't do them. As a lot of you mentioned, uh, it would be very strange uh, at first if you were to hear that a man, uh, you know, became very close with the food merchants that he regularly sees and is so close to them that, you know, he cries into their sweater when uh, he he's upset or is sad. Uh, like even in our culture, in a patriarchal culture, even when a man is really, really sad, it's still unusual to hear about or see him cry into someone's sweater unless that someone was like a wife or girlfriend or like a, a sister, a, a feminine figure. Even if you say like he cried into his his brother's sweater, it would still seem a little bit awkward. Uh, but of course, that's all because of the patriarchal culture of, of our society. Men are people too, right? If we say that women are people who who are uh, who feel a full range of emotions and should have the ability and the opportunity to pursue anything they want in life, then the same should be uh, said of men as well. Of course. Uh, men are open to pursue any opportunity they want in life, but somehow it's it's kind of strange for most people to hear about a man expressing uh, deep and strong emotions. And uh, that's not natural. That's not healthy. Uh, it, when a man like keeps his mo represses his emotions, keeps them down for too long, uh, and not just men, women too. Um, you become a stranger to your emotions and your emotions become strange to you. And so when uh, at some point there's a strong emotion that you are not able to repress and to keep held down, it will burst out of you and it will most closely resemble anger. For some reason, anger is, seems to be the strongest and basest, like the most fundamental emotion uh, that humans have. So any kind of confusion uh, or un, un, like misunderstanding, uh, non-comprehension, 
uh, emotions that you don't understand usually get expressed as anger. And so that's why we have words like hangry, a combination of hungry and angry. You get angry because you're hungry. Uh, even when you know that you're, uh, you, you feel bad because you're hungry, the feeling is still uh, bad enough to cause anger. Or that's why we have like uh, people who uh, are not morning people, who feel uh, grumpy and even angry in the morning. Uh, anytime that you're not in tune with your own emotions, those emotions often get expressed as anger. And as I'm sure you all know, uh, a society full of angry men is not a safe society. It is not a rational or functioning society. Uh, and on the other hand, this is connected to like uh, when the author's mother worries about her living alone in Paris. Uh, a lot of you mentioned that if the author were a man, uh, his mother would be less worried. Uh, I'm not sure that I agree with that 100%, but I do agree that the mother would be slightly less worried. Still worried. Uh, she's a mother. Mothers are always worried about their children. Uh, but it would be understood more as a maternal worry and not as like a general uh, worry about someone living alone in a big city. And this is despite the fact that um, it's, well, not equally dangerous, but it could also be dangerous for men to live alone in the city. Uh, despite uh, cultural stereotypes, most men are not fighters. Uh, and uh, if someone like crazy or high on drugs who needs money uh, chooses to get that money by robbing someone on the street, uh, a single lonely non-fighter type man is also a good as as good a target as like uh, for instance a confident strong woman uh, walking alone at night. Uh, so that's more stereotype and more like maternal worry uh, than like actual uh, need for worry. Um, so on so the flip side of talking about how patriarchal society limits women is that a patriarchal society limits men as well. And that's why, like, uh, if you know about the history of feminism, we are, some people say we are currently in the third wave of feminism. Uh, a very brief history, the first wave of feminism is women wanting civil rights, like the right to vote, the right to open a bank account, the right to have a credit card, the right to, uh, you know, be a full citizen in society. The second wave is more uh, focused on uh, the right to recognize that uh, women don't have to be like men in order to have the same rights as men. That women can also be women but should still be treated as full citizens of society if, even if they choose to be a housewife or choose to be a secretary or other stereotypically uh, female uh, career. The current third wave of feminism, uh, one understanding is that it is now not just about women, but about everyone, including men. And the idea is, as I've just been saying, the society that fosters stereotypes of men and women limits both men and women, and uh, also excludes uh, non-binary people, transgender people, uh, because there are currently no stereotypes about uh, people who are neither men nor women, nor or who are not traditionally men or traditionally women. Uh, the gay rights movement has helped to sort of change that a bit. But uh, and if you think about it, you'll realize that in society, we also have stereotypes about gay people. Um, so on the one hand, gay people have sort of opened up our ideas about uh, men and women. But on the other hand, society has also closed down around gay people to give them their own stereotypes. So the third wave of feminism is focusing on liberating everyone from gender or uh, not genders, well, not gender stereotypes, because we will always have some kind of stereotype, but liberating people from the idea that you have to fit your stereotype. If you're a man, you have to act this way. If you're a woman, you have to act that way. Uh, that causes a lot of pain and suffering in society today.
Question six. I hope you're paying attention because after this week you have to write an essay. Uh, let's begin group by group. Group three. Chose. My mother will always be my first home, but I have learned a second language, a second culture. I have learned how to build a home for myself in the world, and I have learned to be at home within myself. Very sneaky. If this and were a period, it would be four sentences, not three. But lucky for you, it is three sentences. And you guys chose these three sentences because um, it connects the author's current home in Paris with her previous home, with her mother, and the effect that her mother had on her uh, throughout her life. Uh, now, you guys also mentioned that you have to be courageous enough to leave your parents. Um, I, I'm not quite sure that the story supports this interpretation. She did, the author did display courage in leaving home. But we can also say that she had to do that because she, she, her new job was in Paris. Uh, as we saw from the paragraph about being some kind of monster, she really didn't want to go, but she felt like she had to. Uh, the second time she comes back and then goes back to Paris, we could say maybe uh, it's because her life, most of her life was already in Paris. Um, so it made more sense for her to return. Uh, but I don't think the story is saying that we should uh, leave our parents. Like it's better than staying with our parents. Um, but if we do have to leave our parents or choose to leave our parents, we should do it with courage instead of like dragging our feet or pretending that we really don't want to or whatever. Maybe. The other parts of your answer I think make sense. Um, but I think you can try to organize these ideas uh, in the order that the essay presents them. Uh, and in or in the order that the three sentences you chose presents them from her past as a young daughter at home with a caring mother to her present living in a foreign culture using a foreign language uh, and how she transitioned between these two and learned to be at home within herself something like that and so and for each stage to give evidence supporting that part of the essay Group four. You guys chose, it is not an easy choice to build a life apart from the people I love. Uh, it would be better if you can give me a page number here. Um, and you choose this sentence because you think the essay is about the complicated relationship between her and her mother. Uh, her, you describe her mother as sort of overbearing or caring too much. And the daughter or the author as struggling to break away and to form her own life. Um, I guess part of the essay is saying that, uh, especially when you read the part about how her mother would call the police on her daughter in college. Um, but even there in the essay, the author treats that episode as a kind of funny story instead of a basic trauma between herself and her mother. Um, we there is you could read this essay from this perspective. I think it does make sense. Uh, and, but the essay that we see is more influenced by the fact that the author's mother has Parkinson's. So this mindset of having to escape her overbearing mother probably is what uh, what uh, uh, led her to leave to find a job in Paris and to leave her mother in the first place. But of course, that paradigm, that uh, perspective was completely shifted uh, right before she left when she learned that uh, her mother had Parkinson's disease. And that completely changes how she views her relationship with her mother or what her relationship with her mother should be. Uh, so you're right to say that it's a complicated relationship. Uh, but I think you could add a bit more nuance to the before disease and after disease, these two different perspectives. Uh, 
and how the author mentally shifts from one perspective to the other. So again, following the the order of the essay, you would probably have like you begin with the author's uh, childhood with an overbearing mother, and then she escapes to Paris and forms a new life with uh, the people she meets there regularly, and then uh, she turns around to deal with her slowly degenerating mother, and how that gives her a new perspective on how her mother must have felt raising her and taking care of her uh, all those years ago. And of course, for each part, please give evidence. Group two. You guys chose, the only explanation I can offer is that maybe this is what I've been doing all along, looking for the people who will help me find my way back home, wherever that may be. This is a very bold and ambitious choice of sentences partly because I don't really understand what it's trying to say. Uh, it comes at the end of the story, or the essay, uh, and it says that all along the author has been looking for the people who help me find my way back home, wherever that may be. But first of all, she had already said that home is wherever she is. Like she creates uh, a home wherever she feels like she belongs, wherever she feels safe with, by herself. Secondly, uh, if home goes along with her, instead of her seeking for home, then finding my way back home means finding my way back into myself, means finding confidence in myself, means finding the ability to belong wherever I am. And so the people who help her do that are the people who care about her and who value her presence and her ideas, who value their relationship with her. Uh, and so she says, that is what I've been doing all along, looking for people who see me as a human being and who are willing to form a relationship with me whenever I want one with them. Seems to be what this sentence is trying to say. But it's a lot of very different ideas stuck into one sentence. Um, and your, your reason is, uh, uh, she still decided to live in Paris because she learned how to build a home for herself. Um, I think the the cause and effect are flipped here. She doesn't go to Paris because she learns how to build a home for herself. She learns how to build a home for herself because she lived in Paris without her family. Uh, but the last sentence of your reason is, is I think, a good interpretation. Uh, the friends she made in Paris gave her a sense of belonging. Yes, that is true. Uh, but if you do choose this sentence to write your essay, uh, you have to explain it like I just did, about all the very different ideas that are stuck into this one sentence and how these ideas are connected to each other and how they are presented through the progression of the essay as the essay goes forward. Group 5. Huh, you guys forgot to give a purple background to this question. Anyway, which, uh, it, you guys chose the uh, three, technically three sentences. It's a constant concern of mine. Who will help her when I'm not here? The same concern I imagine that she feels for me. Who will help me when she is not here? So I say technically it's three sentences because this is a colon and not a period, but if it were a period, it would be four sentences. You guys are getting really good at choosing the maximum number of allowed sentences. Anyway, uh, you guys chose, this, chose these three sentences because, as you say, uh, the experience of her mother developing Parkinson's disease makes her feel or lets her feel how her mother felt when she, the author, left for Paris. Uh, and this idea of taking care of someone, you guys say, uh, starts the author on thinking about what is a home. Um, I think that's very interesting, but I think you need to do more work to connect these two ideas of a reversal in mother-daughter roles connecting to a redefinition of the idea of home. Um, and I think it might be connected to... Uh, 
when you're being taken care of, usually you're not the one moving around. But if you're taking care of someone else, then the other person is the, the person who is not moving around because the person being taken care of is more dependent. It relies more on other people. So usually they're people who stay in one place uh, most of the time. So as a daughter, the author stayed in one place, so her idea of home was connected with a fixed place and fixed people. But as the daughter who takes care of her mother, as the caretaker, uh, the author now realizes that home isn't just one place, it's wherever she feels uh, belonging, wherever she feels comfortable, wherever she feels a sense of existence or a sense of value to her own existence, where people value her presence there. Uh, and so that's one way you can understand how a mother-daughter reversal can translate into a redefinition of home. And of course, you'll also have to trace this connection uh, over the course of the entire essay and give evidence. By the way, by the way I'm not quite sure why dry cleaners is funny. Someone will have to explain that to me. Uh, you guys chose the last paragraph. Let's take a look. It is not an easy choice to build a life apart from the people I love. The only explanation I can offer is that maybe this is what I've been doing all along, looking for the people who help me find my way back home, wherever that may be. Okay, so basically what I just said for the other group's answer. Your reason for choosing these three sentences is, home for the author is like a jigsaw puzzle. Her mother might be part of it, but it can't be accomplished without the food merchants and other people the author met. That's the reason why the author said she's looking for the people who help her find her way back home. Right, so you explained one part of that sentence. Uh, but as I was just talking about in a previous group, there are a few other parts to answer, to do, explain about that sen these three sentences. Uh, okay. Before next week, please read uh, Worn Out Shoes, do the quiz, and write essay two. Uh, as I mentioned last time, I know writing an essay takes a lot of time and effort to do well. So uh, Worn Out Shoes, which you have to read this week, is very short. Short doesn't mean easy, but it's short. Hopefully that will save you some time. Uh, for this essay, you can choose one out of the previous four texts, which means you have you can choose between one story or one of the three essays. So that's Need to Find Me, Ask My Hand Man, which is last week, Living with Ghosts, I'm Broken, Mostly Friendless, and I've Wasted My Whole Life, or Girl. So any of the four things that we've read since your first essay. Um, the way that you write an essay, a response essay to creative nonfiction, should not, should not be too different from how you write one for fiction. Um, we've discussed the difference between these two in an earlier lecture. If you need a reminder, you can go back and listen to uh, the ending of the lecture for Girl. Uh, and if just remember that when you write a response essay to a creative nonfiction, there is still a kind of story going on. There is still a kind of development or progression from one point to the next point to the next point. So when you write your response essay, it should still try to summarize this piece of creative nonfiction for your reader as if your reader, me, has not read the essay that you're responding to before. Uh, and in the midst of that summary, you can explain the parts that you think are most important and most helpful to arguing for why what you think is the main idea can actually be the main idea, depending on the evidence that you see and the sentence or sequence of at most three sentences that you choose to express this main idea from the essay. Uh, as always, if you have questions, you can always write me an email. I check my inbox quite frequently. Um, see you next week. Good luck.